Hi, welcome to the North Campus Research Complex, commonly known as NCRC. My name is Mache. I'm a second year graduate student in the Kotov Lab. And I'm Anna, I'm a second year graduate student in the Thurber Lab. So we're sorry you couldn't make it here for this weekend, but we're going to do our best to show you the best of our chemical engineering department as best as we can. So let's go. So the NCRC was originally built by Pfizer and then the medical school acquired it in, I think, 2010. So we have a lot of really good lab space here and we're excited to show you guys around. Hey, so we are outside the Eniola lab in NCRC building 28. So we're gonna have Logan and Valentina, two of their first year graduate students, show us around with proper social distancing. Um, so now we can head in and get started. But safety first. All right, so now I'm suited up, let's head in. So these are some of the graduate student offices. This is pretty, Typical for an office at the NCRC. Okay, so we're gonna find Valentina now. Her office is right here. Hey, what's Hi. up? <laughs> uh, we're actually gonna do an experiment today. Let me get my laptop out of my bubble. Logan is gonna be showing us Actual experiment. Let's go to the other side of the lab. Well, then he's going to show us an experiment today. Alrighty. So I'm about to inject polystyrene particles into this pool of blood. And the reason for that is because we can actually use this system and this model, which is an actual two life scale macrofluidic device of a human carotid artery to test how particulate based medicines bind to the walls of large scale arteries. So if we start this up, you're gonna see the blood flow into my perfuser. Um, this dampens it, so like blood in real life, your blood in you is very laminar, and then it flows into here. And once the blood's inside of this, the particles are able to adhere slowly to the endothelial wall that we put inside. Here in the Eniola lab, we focus on drug delivery, particle adhesion, all in human blood. So we've moved on from building 28, now we're over in building 20 in the Biointerfaces Institute. So this is a collection of labs across a few different departments, including some in chemical engineering. So there's a lot of shared resources from the Biointerfaces Institute or BI, um, as well as um, a lot of interdisciplinary work that is going on here. So we're here to visit the Negrath lab where um, Kaylee and Emma will be showing us around. <laughs> Hello, nice to see you all. Hi, <laughs> I'm Emma, um, this is Kaylee, and we are both fourth year graduate students in the Negrath lab, Sunita Negrath lab. Our lab primarily works with cancer cells, so we design microfluidic devices to isolate cancer cells from patient blood, um, and we mostly use these for studies to look at whether a patient's treatment is working, whether we could predict if their treatment is working, um, and things like that. So this is the labyrinth. It's one of the microfluidic devices we use to isolate cells. It uses inertial microfluidics to isolate particles by size. So cancer cells are slightly larger than the other blood components. So they focus to a different spot and we can collect them out of a different outlet than other cells in the blood. 
So if you look at our setup, we have a labyrinth on our microscope here. And so it is connected by tubes to a syringe on a syringe pump. So if this was a patient sample, this would be blood in our syringe here. It would flow into our labyrinth, go through the maze, and then come out one of those four tubes. So if you look at our screen, which is attached to a camera on the microscope, you'll see we have four outlets here. This top one will be where all of the white blood cells come. This will be where the cancer cells come. And this will be where the rest of the debris will come. So if we had a patient sample, in this uh, second channel, we should get really clean, pure cancer cells that we could do all sorts of downstream work on. Okay, let's do it. Okay, so we're going to turn on the microscope box. This is a fluorescent light source that allows us to do fluorescent microscopy through our camera. It's thinking. Think faster. I think it's on. At least it doesn't think. Oh, we can find out. Is oh, it's, on. it's on. Okay, we're gonna turn off the lights. Turn the lights off. Turn off the lights. It's dark. So we're gonna look at this in PE, which is the fluorescent red. Ooh, nice and red. Um, and we're going to move it so you can see more of the channel. Channel. Beautiful. And uh -huh. we can, the red are the cells. So we can hit. We can hit run. Oh, it's hard to see go in the dark. There's go. Okay. So now the pump is flowing. Kaylee's going to mess with the brightness settings. Ooh, look at those circles on there. Nice. Cool, so we have a labyrinth flowing and what you're seeing here is one of the many corners in the labyrinth. And what you see is a really nice red line down the middle. So those are actually cancer cells. So as the, the cells flow through the labyrinth's labyrinth maze, for lack of a better word, um, the cells will focus into a really tiny streamline. And so we're able to collect these really purely from a patient. We are here again in the Biointerfaces Institute to visit the Solomon Lab. So an exciting thing about Professor Solomon is that he is also the Dean of the Rackham Graduate School. We'll have two of his graduate students showing us around over here. Welcome to Solomon Lab. I'm Pong Kai. I'm a 50 year PhD student in chemical engineering department. Um, I'm working with colloid self-assembly and life scattering. My name is Rachel Hamilton, and I'm a second year PhD student in the Solomon Lab, and I'm doing the active motion of colloidal systems. Hi, my name is Tian Yu. I'm the first year PhD student in chemical engineering, and um, uh, my project is the uh, colloidal assembly and structural color. And overall, uh, we are doing soft matter research and uh, include the uh, biomechanics of biofilms, uh, the colloidal assembly and the re rheology and active matter. Okay, I would like to talk about my project about minimum gels. So the idea is we change the shape of colloids and then see if the interaction between particles becomes stronger. So we can use much less particles to make a stronger gels. And to measure that, basically we are using a rheometer here. Um, and uh, the data here will show the modulus and uh, the oscillation strain. So basically, um, if you see a much stronger modulus, that means that the gels is stronger. Hi, um, this is our uh, confocal microscope that we use to view our samples. Um, here I'm using the confocal to observe the active motion of a binary colloidal system. Um, and this is actually a novel approach to generating active motion. And so what I'm doing here is I'm capturing the motion of the particles, which I will then use to um, determine the propulsion speed of said particles using particle tracking algorithms. All right, so our next stop is the WEN lab, which is right through here. So we can head in and find one of the grad students. Hi. I'm Luke Bugatta. I'm a graduate student in the WEN laboratory here at the University of Michigan. 
Uh, our laboratory focuses on protein engineering research, and we kind of have two main areas that we use our protein engineering skills to, uh, to try to solve problems. One is uh, biofuels. So we try to make these enzyme assemblies that can more efficiently break down plant waste and convert it into bioethanol. The other area we do research in is immunology research. So we use protein assemblies to try to cure or treat immunological diseases. And then also we use these assemblies to better understand the immune system. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and give you guys a tour of our lab space. So this is, this is our kind of our main lab area. We've got all lab benches along here and a hood where we do cell culture work. Over here, we have gel electrophoresis so we can run SDS page gels to analyze proteins and agarose gels to look at DNA. Um, and here we've got an FPLC. Uh, this is just basically a really fancy pump and we use it to uh, purify proteins. Uh, and we can separate out proteins based on size, based on affinity for certain metals, and also based on the charge of the proteins. So in here we have a flow cytometer. And a flow cytometer is uh, a really powerful instrument because we can look at what proteins are expressed on individual cells. So Cells will run through the flow cytometer one at a time. We'll shoot them with the laser, and that laser can tell us what fluorophores are on the cells. Each fluorophore is uh, attached to an antibody, and then an antibody binds to a specific protein. So if we can see what the fluorescence of each cell, it tells us what proteins are there and how many of each protein is present um, on each cell. Here we have uh, a cytop, uh, a mass cytometer, and this actually works in kind of some of the principles for this mass cytometer are very similar to flow cytometry. So we're looking at individual cells, one cell at a time. And here, instead of uh, using fluorescence to look at the cells, we're actually ionizing the cells and looking at the metals present in each cell. So here, instead of using fluorophores attached to antibodies, we're using heavy metals attached to antibodies. So if there was a protein we wanted to detect on a cell, we would have an antibody for that protein. It'll bind to the cell and then we'll have heavy metals attached to that antibody. By looking at the heavy metals, it tells us what proteins are on each cell and how many there are. The main advantage to mass cytometry when compared to flow cytometry is that we can look at like 50 different proteins at once, whereas with flow cytometry, it's really hard to look at more than about six. So we can get a ton of information about cells using mass cytometry. And this is especially important when you're looking at the immune system. The immune system just consists of an army of a bunch of different types of cells, and they express dozens and dozens, actually hundreds of different proteins. So really to be able to understand the immune system, it's important to get this high dimensional data from machines like the mass cytometer. Over here, we actually have another mass cytometer. Uh, this one's a little bit different. Instead of looking at individual cells and suspension one at a time, we can actually look at tissue. So uh, you get spatial information as well. In imaging mass cytometry, uh, instead of ionizing each cell individually, we uh, shoot a tissue sample with the laser and ionize uh, a square micron of tissue at a time. We can then look at the metals present in this, in each square micron, and this tells us what proteins are in the tissue and where, so we can put together what cells are present, where they are, and get information as to which cells are next to each other and how they might be interacting. So here we have a tissue sample from uh, the colon actually. And you can see that all, um, so looking at it, we have all these different colors and each of these colors is for a different protein expressed in the colon. Uh, specifically, you can kind of see these uh, circles here and these are actually the villi within your colon. Right now, this is part of a cancer, the data we're collecting right now is part of a cancer microarray in which we're looking at samples from breast cancer, colon cancer, uh, kidneys, and uh, a bunch of other organs. So welcome to the Thurber lab. This is my lab, as I mentioned, and I'm a second year here. So overall, as a lab, we work in a few different areas. So we work on imaging agent design, drug distribution, and peptide engineering. And the common theme across all of these areas is that we want to understand the relationship between the structure of these various uh, materials and the way that they behave in biological systems. So we're here in our mammalian cell culture room, which is a space that we also share with the WEN lab. Um, so we have an incubator here where the cell babies live, and then we have two biological safety cabinets over there where we do our cell culture work. 
Um, so some of the other equipment that we use, um, as we saw earlier, we use the HPLC, but we also rely on um, flow cytometry that the WEN lab showed us as well, as well as um, microscopy and a few other techniques. So what this lets us do is look over multiple length scales and biological systems. So on the confocal um, microscope, we're able to see subcellular resolution, and then we can go all the way up to whole animal resolution systemic on the systemic scale there. Okay, so here we're doing some cell culture work with antibody drug conjugates or ADCs. So we'll be incubating the cells with the antibody drug conjugates um, at various time points to see how the cells traffic and process the ADC over that time course. So one of the ways that we'll be processing these samples is using pharmacodynamic staining or PD staining. So this helps us track the response of cells to the cytotoxic payload that they're being treated with. Um, so how we're able to do this is we have a fluorescent marker that is able to mark the DNA damage. And as cells um, experience this DNA damage after treatment with the ADC, we're able to see how that shows up over the time course, which gives us information about how the ADC is trafficked into cells, how quickly it's internalized, and other things of that nature. Hey, I'm Tejas. I'm a sixth year in the Thurber lab. And right here is an HPLC, and I'm purifying a peptide. So what I've been working on for the past few years is developing a way of screening libraries of peptides. So I've been using E. coli um, as a bacterial system to screen these peptides. And once we screen them and pick a couple really good candidate peptides, we then make them and then purify them by HPLC. So that's what I'm up to today is um, collecting peaks that correspond to the peptides I want. So you see this peak here, that's some peptide and I've collected it. And after this is done, I'm gonna head over to chemistry and do some mass spec to confirm its identity. Okay, so now we are here at the Comchev lab. We're still in building 28 of NCRC where a lot of the chemical engineering labs are, although we have a few spread out throughout. So um, we can see all of their lovely lab members on the door here. Um, and we're gonna head inside. Hey, we're here. <laughs> oh. Hi, welcome to the Comchev lab. In this lab, what we do is we work with polymer membranes, and we want to try to find applications of these materials in uh, fields of society, basically trying to make these materials to be used in desalination plants, uh, electrodialysis membranes. And today we have a demo for you, and we're going to make a polymer membrane. And the polymer membrane that we're going to make today is the PEGDA SPA system. PEGDA is a long monomer and SPA is a shorter one. However, the SPA polymer is charged with a with a with an oxygen group, a sulfone group, and a potassium salt. What we basically do in this demo is we polymerize these two monomers and we create a polymer network. It's a copolymer and this is what gives us the membranes that we use for this. Lemo, we're going to use a UV crosslinker, and we have our polymer solution right here. The polymer solution, we do it by just mixing the two monomers that I just talked about, and we add water, and this just mixes uh, nicely, and then we add an initiator, which helps the reaction um, start and continue and polymerize. The way we do this is we have this small plate where we place our polymer solution. And on top of this plate, we'll place another one, more like a circle, to squish the polymer solution and then leave it in the oven um, and it polymerizes uh, and we can get the membrane out. We usually have membranes that are uh, circle and we do that because we usually need them in this form to uh, be able to use them. So now we're gonna put the polymer solution on top of the plate. By the way, these are separators that allows us to have, make our membranes thicker or thinner the way we want it. We basically put some drops of the polymer, free polymer solution on the plate. And then we squish this free polymer mixture with another plate. We turn on the oven. 
So now it's at 180 seconds. And after we do that, we're going to get our membrane. So now that our polymerization has ended, um, what we usually do is we try to separate the two plates to obtain our membrane. Usually the plates are um, a little bit stuck because the membrane polymerizes over the whole surface area. So what we do is we try to pray open the two plates. And when that doesn't work, we use uh, some force. And as you can see here, we got, we obtain our polymer membrane. And it's really flexible, ductile, and it can break also. And we place it in a salt solution. And that salt solution, what allows us to do is to clean the membrane of any unreacted pre-polymers mixture. And after that, we can use it. We could cut it in different ways and use it in, in the different experiments that we do to characterize the membrane. Thank you so much for uh, visiting our lab and uh, looking at demo for making membranes. So we want to thank you for joining us on these lab tours. We had a lot of fun showing you around and we hope that you enjoyed seeing our labs and learning about the awesome research that we're doing at the University of Michigan. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to any of the grad students that you may have seen in the video. If you didn't see anybody that you're interested in, all of our information is on the chemical engineering website. And remember to wash your hands. <laughs>